Hello, and welcome to the first lecture, Lecture 1A of International Law and Organization. Obviously, this is a course about international law and organization. It is uh, what it says in the box, but what does that mean? Well, international just means something that happens in two or more countries, right? So a plane takes off in one country, lands in another, that's an international flight. International Women's Day is international because it's celebrated in more than one country. The song Despacito is an international sensation because unfortunately uh, it's famous in many countries. International organization, how the international system is organized, and international organizations, the groups and institutions that cross national boundaries, are topics we're going to address more fully in the second half of the course. That leaves that middle word in the course title, law. So what is law? That might seem like a silly question, but in all seriousness, um, I'm going to ask you to stop this video. Uh, it's a very important question, so I want you to stop this video, think about it, and go answer on the first discussion board. I'll go ahead and wait. Did you answer the question? Did you look at other students' comments and answers and maybe comment on them? Good. So what is law? It's a specific type of system for governing human conduct. That is, law tells us what to do and what not to do in a variety of situations. I say specific because there are many systems for governing human conduct. Ethics, morality, religion are all systems for governing human conduct. You might volunteer at a soup kitchen or give money to charity because you feel it's your ethical, moral, or religious duty. Politeness and etiquette are other systems for governing conduct. Most of us are probably raised to say hello when we meet people, but 150 years ago, we might have been taught to bow, curtsy, kiss a lady's hand, or say something like, the pleasure's all mine, or charmed, I am sure. Uh, and these systems for governing human conduct tend to influence us to do things we might not otherwise want to do, right? We might not otherwise get up and say, I want to volunteer at a soup kitchen, but if we feel like it is our ethical, moral, or religious responsibility to do so, we will. So what separates law from these other systems governing behavior? Again, I'm going to ask you to pause the video, uh, think about it, go to the discussion board, the second discussion board this time, and, and post your answer. Then look at what other students have posted uh, and, and see if you can respond to, uh, to some of them. Again, I'll wait. Now, the difference between law and other institutions, right, other systems for governing human conduct, uh, is that law is usually made by uh, institutions, usually government institutions, that can use coercion uh, and other penalties such as jail time or fines to enforce them. Now, in most democracies, uh, the job of making law, the job of uh, making decisions about law, whether someone has violated the law or not, also we could call that interpreting law, uh, and enforcing law are generally done by three distinct entities, right? Usually, uh, in democracies, especially liberal democracies, making the making of law is left to the legislature, like Congress in the United States or Parliament in England. Indeed, uh, making law is the central job of the legislature. That's where the word comes from. Their job is to legislate, right? Deciding whether or not these laws have been followed or violated is usually up to another part of the state. And again, in the United States, this is to a different uh, branch of government, right? This is usually to the courts. And again, like the legislature, this is essentially the whole reason that courts exist, right? So two-thirds of the branches of the United States government are basically about creating and interpreting law, right? Um, now, that third aspect of law, the enforcement of law, uh, is usually done in most liberal democracies by a police force, right? Uh, that falls under the executive branch. So really all three branches of government in the United States are very concerned with and deal a lot with law. So the thing that makes law special is it is created by and enforced by the state. If someone says hello to you um, and it is good manners to say hello back and you don't do it, the only real consequence is that people might think you're rude, they might stop saying hello to you, but you're not going to go to jail, you're not going to face any fines, there's no real coercive power behind this etiquette, right? Um, and 
But this etiquette is created by us socially. Maybe it's created by people like Dear Abby or Ann Landers. Um, but they don't have the power of government of coercion, right? So why do we have law? Well, basically because those other systems for governing human behavior, things like morality, religion, and manners are simply insufficient. They're not good enough to do what they need to do. Um, without law, man is dangerously close to a state of nature. And the state of nature is a concept that comes up a lot in political philosophy and describes the conditions of humans without government, without a state or laws. Now, this is usually a theoretical concept used to explain why we have governments, right? It's, it's more of an idea um, than describing an actual reality that ever existed. Um, but if you think of a sort of caricature of a Wild West movie where the biggest, baddest cowboy with the blackest hat and the most six shooters can do whatever he wants, at least till the new sheriff rolls into town and restores order, that's kind of what a state of nature is, right? Um, or you can think of sort of Lord of, the, uh, Lord of the Flies if you read that book. Um, uh, there's no rules, there's no enforcement, there's no authority. And Thomas Hobbes, who's probably the most important uh, thinker on the subject, famously describes the state of nature as uh, war of every man against every man, and says that life in such a state would be solitary, poor, nasty, brutish, and short. But this isn't only a Western concept, and I, uh, my background is primarily in the study of uh, Chinese politics. Uh, so I would be remiss if I didn't point out that Modza, uh, a Chinese philosopher writing almost 2,000 years before Hobbes, had very much the same idea. And what he said was, in the beginning of human life, when there was yet no law and government, everyone acted according to their own sense of morality. Each man had his own idea of morality. Two men had two different ideas, and ten men had ten different ideas. The more people, the more different notions, right? And everybody approved of his own view and disapproved of the views of others. This is starting to sound kind of familiar, um, hopefully. And so arose mutual dis uh, disapproval among men. As a result, father and son and elder and younger brothers became enemies since they were unable to reach any agreement. Everyone fought each other with water, fire, and poison. Surplus energy was not spent for mutual aid. Surplus goods were allowed to rot without sharing. The human world could be compared to that among birds and beasts. So again, what Modza is saying is if you don't have an overarching uh, system that people have to consent to, um, more or less, uh, then you're going to have anarchy. You're going to have people killing each other, even their close family members. You're, you're not going to have people working together. Um, goods are going to go to waste. Basically, it's the same way uh, that that animals interact, or perhaps solitary animals interact, herd inter animals probably do better than that, in fact. So we need a government, and that government needs a set of laws, so when two people disagree, there's a standard to govern their behavior. It probably also needs courts to settle disagreements and police to enforce a court's decision. This is, why the way, by the way, why a religious uh, commune generally doesn't need laws, right? Because everyone in there has already agreed to a set of norms, a set of rules governing behavior uh, based on religion, right? But that's, that's quite a unique circumstance because you've entered this commune or say this convent um, uh, uh, specifically because of your strong religious beliefs in this specific set of ideals. So um, if all this stuff on law sounds pretty straightforward, and hopefully it does, and this were a class on domestic law, we could probably stop here. But the problem with international law is that these mechanisms we're talking about, um, the laws uh, that make up the system that governs human behavior, don't exist at the international level in the same way. There's no legislature at the international level. There are, no, there are some courts, but not at the same extent. There are some police, but not at the same extent. Um, and so in this sense, the international system might actually be closer to a state of nature uh, than a country with a rule of law. In fact, serious scholars of law and international relations make the argument that there's really no such thing about international law. This is pretty amazing if you think about it. You're in one of the few classes in which serious scholars on the subject might argue that it simply doesn't even exist, right? This is not something you're going to find in a physics class or a Victorian literature class. Um, there might be disagreements about how to define it, but no one's going to say this topic doesn't even exist. Um, and so this is the hole that I'm going to try to dig us out of for the rest of the semester. Is there such a thing as international law? Spoiler alert, I'm going to argue yes, because otherwise why would we be here? Um, 
But international law seeks to accomplish many of the same things as domestic law without the same clear-cut institutions and boundaries and legitimacy as domestic law. This makes studying international law perhaps more difficult, but also endlessly fascinating, at least in my view. I hope you'll agree. Thanks so much for joining me here today.